Hi, and welcome to Ones and Twos, FP's economics podcast. Every week we take a couple data points, use them to try to explain the world. I'm Cameron Abadi, FP's deputy editor with you in Berlin, Germany. Joining me here in Berlin, in fact, in my home office, is Adam Twos, FP's economics columnist and Columbia University professor. Hi, Adam. Hi, Cam. So, the Christmas season is coming up, so we thought we would try out a special episode, one dedicated to Christmas. The data point we have there is 525 million, which is the number of kids approximately around the world who will be celebrating Christmas. Each of those kids will probably be expecting some sort of toy under their Christmas tree or some other kind of present. Most of them will perhaps be expecting that it will be arriving from Santa. There's only one Christmas question that matters to children at this time of night. Will Santa make it? Well, we've just had... You know, we're getting close to Christmas when NORAD fires up its Santa tracker website. So starting today, you can... He's not here Santa just yet, but as of 6 a.m., he has been spotted delivering presents to all the good boys and girls. Of course, Santa is the mythic symbol of the Christmas season operating in the North Pole together with his team of elves to build all of the toys that the kids around the world use. It struck us that for all the discussion of Santa, he's never really been examined as an economic figure. Obviously, this is an economics podcast, so we thought we would try to think about Santa from an economic perspective. Bear with us as we try to get into some of the details here. So yeah, first, I wanted to ask about the North Pole, which is where Santa operates together with his elves. I was wondering what exactly is the economic status right now of the North Pole? Is it subject to any country's economic laws? You know, what sort of jurisdiction is it? Is it in any country's exclusive economic zone? Or does Santa just kind of have dominion, we can assume, over this over this territory? Yeah, the fact that we're asking this question at all is a sign of the times, really, because 100 years ago, the North Pole was totally inaccessible. Countries were racing each other to actually reach it with daring expeditions, many of which came to grief, notably Captain Scott's from the British Imperial side. Nowadays, with climate change, uh, the entire zone of the Arctic has become you know, open for grabs, really, and is the subject of really intense competition between Russia, the United States, Sweden, Norway, Iceland, Finland, Denmark, Canada, and the legal terms of this are all sorted or supposed to be sorted anyway by the United Nations Convention on the Laws of the Sea, which has been ratified by all of those states other than the United States, which has signed but not yet ratified it, presumably because they don't fancy the chances of getting it through a hyper-sovereignist and nationalist Congress. And also America would rather not be bound by its terms. I mean, what that specifies is that you have a 12 nautical mile territorial sea zone and then a 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone. And then if you can claim a contiguous uh, shelf, continental shelf, much more territory. And the drama of the Arctic is that these claims, unsurprisingly, if you think about the top of an orange and you're slicing it, they tend to intersect as you go straight out. And the real drama of the last, literally the, of this last year, is that in February of 2023, the UN Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf awarded a prior claim to the North, North Pole and the entire territory of the fabulously named Lomonosov Ridge to Putin's Russia, which currently has the standing legal claims ratified by the UN to the North Pole. Canada and Denmark also have claims which could be in contention to contest this. But it has to be said that one would rather the whole thing was maybe declared Santa land and we could, we could have enough of this dispute because it's otherwise looking pretty ugly. Well, and then if we were to just take it in its sort of archetypal form, what kind of potential model for an economy does Santa's North Pole represent? I mean, it strikes me that this is a highly productive economy, but at the same time, it doesn't trade at all. Obviously, it does a lot of exchange in some sense, but all of that is in the form of gifts that the economy is providing for others. So how should we think about Santa acquiring the resources to build the toys that he produces there? I mean, should we assume that at the same time as he's operating this workshop, he's also 
overseeing some kind of criminal operation to steal basic resources. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I prepare these questions, but uh, you know, <laughs> nevertheless, hard to hard to keep a straight, hard to keep a, hard to keep a straight face. Um, yeah, should we be assuming there's some kind of piracy? <laughs> so, anyway, yeah, what is the model here for him acquiring commodities? <laughs> Well, I, I think I'm going to let Cowan get, get, get a grip of himself over there. He's kind of losing it rather sweetly. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think it's typical nowadays to, like, criticize Christmas. I was put in mind of uh, Georges Bataille, who, um, the French critical theorist, who in the 1940s, when he was thinking about the Marshall Plan, analogized it to the potlatch practice of the uh, Native American tribes of the Pacific Northwest to engage in this gratuitous expenditure of resource uh, in acts of sort of ritual hierarchy, in a sense. I mean, Samta, what Samta's doing is essentially establishing hegemony over the, the child world, of children of the world, by this gratuitous act. So in a sense, the economics are very powerful, but they're kind of subversive of conventionally exchanged logic. It's not perhaps entirely by accident that the figure of Santa Claus in the, in the current form that, that we know that figure, though it derives from ancient European uh, roots, presumably uh, in the St. Nicholas tradition and in... Um, Dutch traditions, uh, the Dutch figure of Sinterklaas, actually emerges in you know, the commercial society of New York and America in the 1820s. So in a sense there you have this image, I think, of commercial abundance as being a central idea. Theft, you know, you could also imagine lying in the background here that as comic as the idea is in some senses, there is this you know, subsumption of vast amounts of resource which are, in some senses, uncompensated. I'm taking this all far too seriously, I can tell. <laughs> but, but at some level, you know, there is the possibility there of the Santa figuring as this weird, unrequited, abundant source of childish pleasure, which does indeed, at some level, rest on, on a material foundation that we'd rather not explore. No, that's useful to know that every time we're giving gifts, we're doing something aggressive somehow. That's sort of, yeah, there's a kind of uh, an assertion there. You know, it's worth keeping in mind, at, I guess, at this gift-giving season. But to return to, to Santa, obviously, as I've mentioned, his workforce is composed of elves. I mentioned the number of 525 million kids. If we were just to do some basic back-of-the-envelope math to try to figure out how many elves there might be, be. I saw this calculation somewhere if there are about three toys per kid and you have elves working 364 days a year, assume they take off Christmas, they're working eight hours, standard workday, creating maybe four toys per hour. That calculation returns the figure 134,216 elves in Santa's workforce. So we can sort of imagine a pretty, you know, some small size American city of elves that Santa is overseeing somehow. And, and I guess that raises the question for me of, you know, what is their status as workers? How should we sort of be thinking about them in that way? Are they then, like, in fact, slaves of a kind? I mean, like we, we just mentioned, Santa doesn't have, you know, other access to, to resources. There's no talk of any other kind of currency there. So, I mean, is it is there any other kind of circumstantial evidence that we have that, that would make it plausible that the elves themselves are, are slaves in the North Pole economy? I have to say I was completely horrified by this. Like, how on earth did we end up talking about Santa's elves as slaves? But apparently, um, apparently opinion polls, of, at least of American audiences, when you ask them what the employment status of elves presumably is it's like solid majorities of americans respondents say they must be slaves i mean it's 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 kind of horrifying and, and in i guess in european mythology and even as recently as the harry potter series there is the figure of the the house elf who um is a form of of slave a voluntary slave a sort of creature bound to its masters by its own desires so there's some there's some kind of horrendous connection here which i kind of want to I want to kind of question because, you know, what would be the economic model that would lead you to believe that the elves in the North Pole would be slaves? I mean, the, 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 I think the, the simple line would be that Santa's got to get the job done. He's the potentate and the North Pole is a place which is uh, a cold, inhospitable and 
and um, desperately short of labour. And so, in a sense, you'd expect the overlord of the North Pole to adopt uh, a policy of coerced labour. This, this actually is the theory of slavery as an economic historical phenomenon and advanced by uh, Russian economist Evzi Domar, who, who taught, amongst other people, Paul Krugman at Yale in the, in the 1970s. But it's not an uncontested theory, and there is a rival theory which argues rather the opposite, that in a territory like the North Pole, if, you, if there were enough people there, they, they, they presumably would easily be able to escape the power of the, the prevailing state. And really the fundamental issue is what alternative forms of employment do they have? That's really what decides the, the power of the, the potential slave driver. This is a theory offered by somebody like Thomas Malthus, who argued that in the wake of the Black Death of the 14th century, uh, serfdom was abolished by the, uh, under the pressure of labor scarcity after the epidemic disaster of that period. And there's, in fact, a paper by Darren Asimoglu and his collaborator Alexander Volitsky from the MIT Economics Department from 2011, which tries to balance these two elements against each other. And I think we'd probably find the North Pole precariously balanced between, on the one hand, the, you know, the powerful imperative of the Santa Lord to demand control over whatever labor was there. And on the other hand, the elves running away to do hunting, shooting and fishing in the wild wastes where they would be inaccessible to, the, I don't know, the storm troopers of the Santa Lord. One can kind of imagine here a crossover between Star Wars and, and Santa. I'm just like working hard on cracking Cameron up at this point. That is the kind of territory that I think we're in here. Okay, we're going to take a break here, but we will be back in a second to continue talking about uh, the economics of Santa. Okay, we are back. Let's turn to reindeer, which in addition to elves, is probably the other essential ingredient of the Santa story. So what is the state of the reindeer herd economy in the polar region right now? And when it comes to reindeer sledding in particular, have there been any important developments there? Yes, yeah, so, so reindeer apparently belonged to the Santa story for about as long as there's been a Santa story, so going back to the 1820s, and they were in fact named. I always thought this was a Disney thing, but Dasher, Dancer, Prancer, Vixen, Comet, Cupid, originally Dunder and Blixen, which then became Donner and Blitzen in the Germanization. These were the, the names first given to the, to the reindeer in the classic, shall we say, early 19th century uh, Victorian versions of the story. They feed off a reality. Um, the Sami people of the Arctic have been um, herding reindeer in the modern sense for about 500 years. Uh, they, they originally were purely itinerant and would live in symbiosis with the wild reindeer herds. But for about half a millennium, they've now been cultivating the, the reindeer. Mainly, it has to be said, and unfortunately for their meat and their horns, but also as a source of attraction. I mean, reindeer are kind of phenomenal creatures. I mean, they're smaller and heavier than caribou that folks in North America may know. But they have extraordinary adaptations to winter weather. They've got giant splayed hooves, which means that they can move over soft snow and they're very good at swimming. And the most astonishing thing about them is their heavy coats. So they have two coats, an outer one, which has long hollow hair, which gives aerating insulation, about 5,000 hairs per square inch on the outer layer. And then the inner coat, which is woolly and fine, they have up to 13,000 hairs per square inch. And the effect of this is that a full-sized reindeer can sit in snow and the snow doesn't melt around the warm animal's body. Um, they can give birth in extreme temperatures. Their nostrils are adapted so that they don't freeze up. They have ways of eating snow, uh, which allow them to, to hydrate in extreme weather. But they are really driven to migrate as a result of their adaptation. They don't do very well in warm temperatures, which is why climate change is such a threat to these populations. They are and have always been routinely used for pulling sleighs, uh, sledging. They are not, however, as well developed as the as the dog technology. Um, dog sleighs are a much more 
develop technology. But one has to imagine, I think, that for Santa be, to be performing the feats that he is, he's using one of the kind of more high-tech dog sleighs because those now feature aircraft aluminium, uh, extremely resilient um, fiberglass and fiber constructions. The, the runners are rapidly replaceable. They can withstand impact with really large objects. Essentially, they have to be built light and flexible. And one can imagine, I think, a gigantic one of these may be equipped with wings from a 747 or some sort of insane construction like this. But there is one essential fact that we have to correct about the Santa myth, and it's less to do with the physics of the whole thing flying than with the gender of the reindeers. Because one thing that every Sami knows about a reindeer is that the male reindeer lose their horns in the winter. And so every single one of the Santa reindeer is a girl. That's a that's a good lesson, yeah. And that's uh, those other facts. I think are also useful. Maybe they're part of a kind of lesser known verse of the Rudolph song: the number of hairs on on the reindeer uh, fur and the status of their nostrils. Um, but yeah, I guess to turn back to Santa himself, I guess I wanted to ask if there is some kind of relationship between Santa and neoliberalism. And I'm thinking here of some of the critiques that have been written about by the French social theorist Michel Foucault, specifically how he described the system of neoliberalism imposing its logic of social control. I mean, this is basically the system of our current system of capitalism, having a kind of version of social control that that is uh run by types of self-surveillance and and this this reminded me of santa as being this sort of super ego figure sort of checking his list for naughty and nice kids etc i mean is there a kind of relationship between santa and this foucaultian critique uh obviously the, the foucault is known uh for for citing the panopticon is sort of santa overseeing some kind of santopticon over all of us he sees you when you're sleeping, he knows when you're awake, he knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. I mean, I mean, it's Foucault right there, right? Uh, he sees you when you're sleeping, he knows when you're awake. Uh, it's right, right in there. Uh, a panopticlause, I think you could, you could counter your synopticon with. I don't think there's any doubt at all that it is part of a kind of... It comes out of a German Protestant culture or a Dutch. I mean, the, the Santa Claus kind of fantasies are all clustered around the Puritan Protestant northwestern corner of Europe. And um, there's some sort of punishment regime being enacted here. I mean, I guess the one question I had thinking about Foucault's epic, you know, Discipline and Punishment book is exactly what genre of punishment Santa Claus really or Saint Nick really fits into. I mean, on the one hand, there is indeed this pressure of, you know, he sees you when you're sleeping, he knows when you're awake, this sort of he's inside your head. And on the, on the other hand, there is the kind of ritual element of beatings and sticks and lumps of coal. And there's a kind of element here of rather public ritual humiliation. So maybe this is some nightmarish combination of the two or layer upon layer of different disciplinary tradition that's going on here. I have to say, I mean, if you were brought up in the, you know, some of the more benign Christmas cultures, the punitive element features barely at all any anymore. But I gather, I mean, reading online, it was quite hilarious. There's an entire genre of like Foucauldian critiques of <laughs> Santa Claus child rearing and especially of the hugely elaborate, vaguely sort of gaslighting attempts that parents make to maintain the, the Santa story, you know, into kids, uh, you know, deep into their childhoods. So there's a, you know, there's a destabilization. I mean, personally, I remember being quite forensic about it and discovering from my like days jet lag parents one Christmas that, you know, the assignment of responsibility for presents was was garbled and this was really the giveaway or rather what it did was to move a deep suspicion into the area of certainty this was the moment where where my kind of dawning awareness that this probably didn't function in the way the story worked you know really at this point didn't gel with the fact that the atlas which was being ascribed to santa was now being claimed by my father as a christmas present that that was really the kind of the giveaway moment a failure of discipline on the parents part ultimately who is it who's being disciplined here you could say who is it who's being required to maintain 
the elaboration. If on the one hand the kids have to be good, the parents have to ensure the kids' innocence somehow. So finally, I wanted to ask about the relationship between Christmas and, and Germany. Obviously, we're sitting here in Berlin right now, and Germany is often a topic on this podcast. And, and in reflecting on Christmas, it struck me that the that the traditions associated with Christmas, all of them, from from uh, from the Christmas tree to um, the sentimental spending of time with family and the nostalgia associated with the holiday, it's all especially intense here. And I'm curious if Christmas, in some ways, really derived from Germany, uh, or whether German politics made a decision to cultivate Christmas here in a special way, yeah, and whether it's really all uh, traced back to German bourgeois national culture, everything that we think about uh, and associate with Christmas. Yeah, I, I was reading, I was in fact teaching as part of, a, of an end of term class at Columbia, a really fascinating book by a historian called Joe Perry, which is literally called Christmas in Germany, a cultural history. Look it up online, or you can also find it referenced in the chart book newsletter that I put out. And he, he tells a really fascinating story about the emergence of our modern conception of Christmas as this sentimental a moment in he sees it emerging in Germany in the early 1800s really in the post Napoleonic period and then it migrates from there by way of figures like Prince Albert uh, Queen Victoria's consort to Victorian Britain which is one of the great taste making capitals of the world at the time there are also major German communities in France in the at that time very blurry boundaries between France and Germany with Alsatians spread across France including in Paris who are syncretizing various elements of the German Christmas tradition, including, for instance, the Christmas tree, which is first recorded in Germany from the 1600s onwards, or Christmas cake like the Stollen, the kind of buttery raisin-studded cake, sometimes with marzipan. The first recording of that is in Dresden in the late 1400s. They required papal approval to add butter during the fasting season pre-Christmas. So those sorts of things are coming together. But, I mean, the book is fascinating as a cultural history because, as he points out, the first quintessential description of a modern Christmas, as we would understand it, with the tree and the presents and the excitement and, the, you know, the, the parents kind of manipulating the kids' emotions all around this is Nutcracker and Nutcracker and the Mouse King, which we think of as a ballet scored by Tchaikovsky. And it's, you know, if, you're, if you're, you're a parent, you may very well end up taking your kids to see it or may have danced in it yourself as Christmas. But it was actually written by the German romantic folklorist, if you like, E.T.A. Hoffmann. And, and it was published in 1816, a year after Napoleon's final defeat at Waterloo. And if you think about it in those terms, the entire story takes on a different vein because, like, who is the mouse king, really, in the story? And, and you, are suddenly, you suddenly realize that Marie is constantly struggling with her little brother who actually lives in a world of toy soldiers, which are essentially just replicating the Napoleonic campaigns, which finished a year before. So the whole thing takes on a much more contemporary feel. And if that, as it were, is the script for what a bourgeois family Christmas looks like with, you know, fancy presents under a tree and a world of fantasy that the kids are ushered into, for the theology, the kind of weird hybrid Christian piety that associated with modern Christmas, which has some elements which are sort of disturbingly superstitious, and yet we nevertheless embrace as a kind of moment of family harmony in which women in particular are absolutely central. There, again, you go to German texts from the same period. So the theologian Schleiermacher um, in 1805 published a, a really key text of modern Protestant theology about a family conversation of the meaning of Christmas in which people were arguing, well, I know it's superstitious nonsense, but nevertheless, something about the Christ child is going on here. And it's a thoroughly kind of modern conversation about the balance between Christian belief and, and superstition. And then to add the sort of psychodynamics of modern Christmas, you don't have to look any further than Goethe's really smash hit of 1774, The Sorrows of Young Werther, uh, which culminates with sorrowful young Werther shooting himself in the head at his desk on Christmas Eve. So you have there, if you like, the script for Christmas angst or seasonal affective disorder afflicting very large parts of the Christian world around this time. So I think it's little wonder, really, if you add all of those components together, that by the early 19th century, the holiday really had become very closely associated, including its emotional dynamics with Germany. And then the juggernaut of capitalism takes hold of it. And from the mid-19th century onwards, it becomes one of the key marketing 
drives of the German toy industry, um, which is genuinely one of the major employers in small manufacturing of central Germany, notably of Thuringia. They're the people who do all the fancy woodworking. And by 1900, about 80% of the toys imported to Britain, which is the richest European market of the time, they come from Germany, off the back, essentially, of this association of sentimental bourgeois childhood, this weird melange of Christianity and commerce with the German Christmas spirit. It is remarkable the extent of sentimentality associated with the holiday here, uh, you know, nostalgia for family, etc. It just it's very deep. But there is also this element of commerce, which I'm very familiar with from the United States, obviously. But uh, maybe we managed to deflate some of the sentimentality with our analysis of Santa's workshop. But yeah, we wish uh, everyone out there celebrating Christmas a happy holiday. And uh, we'll be with you next week. See you all soon. Ones and Twos is written and edited by me, Cameron Abadi, along with Adam Twos. It's produced by Claudia Tady, Laura rossbrow Tellum, Rob Sachs, and Dan Efron. This show is made possible through the support of foreign policy readers. If you're interested in news and analysis from around the world, consider subscribing. Listeners to Ones and Twos even get a 15% discount. Just go to foreignpolicy.com slash subscribe and use the promo code TWOS at checkout. That's T-O-O-Z-E. And listeners, as always, we love getting your feedback. You can leave voice messages on the Ones and Twos homepage on foreignpolicy.com or email us, podcast at foreignpolicy.com, or you can tweet us. That's at Ones and Twos Pod. Thanks very much for listening, and we'll be back in your feed next week. Mm-hmm.